Chapter Six of the Master Mystery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Master Mystery by John W. Gray and Arthur B. Reeve. Chapter Six. Locke struggled with superhuman effort to release himself from the straitjacket in which he was held prisoner. The throat straps pressed against the neck muscles, and the strain on the straps could be heard like pistol shots as the leather stretched under his prodigious efforts. With every nerve keyed up and his reflexes answering his keen brain, he swayed backward and forward, rolled from side to side, until his shoulder blades were thrown completely out of joint. The pain was intense but he summoned every ounce of strength at his command and finally succeeded in getting one of his arms free by gradually working his body toward a settee where, with his elbow on the seat, he pushed his disjointed arm over his head. Agony was written all over his face as, at last, with a final effort, he extricated his arms and was in a position to loosen the straps which bound them with his teeth. Nor was his labor over now. The canvas jacket cut into his flesh, and the buckles bruised his muscles. His body ached with weariness, yet he clung to his task. Like a thing incarnate, he toiled as he realized the danger that confronted Eva. Upstairs, the monster was pursuing Eva. The heavy oaken doors were as straws to him, and he plunged through them as a mad elephant dashes through a cane break. Destruction lay in his wake as he crashed through the improvised barriers which Eva had constructed to delay his onslaught. A crouching, desolate figure, she waited for what she knew to be her end. There was only one barrier left between her and this engine of destruction. It was only a moment now when she would be a crushed, mangled mass. With terror in her heart, she waited for the thing to crash through the last remaining barrier, and even now she could hear his ponderous step as he crossed the room toward the door which would only momentarily stay his progress. Her lips moved in prayer as she waited, and the dread moments seemed eons to her. Suddenly she heard a crash, and she could see the panels of sturdy oak in the door give way as though they were eggshells. The gigantic fist of the monster crashed through, and she could discern the dim outline of the enormous head and the glaring eyes of fire looking toward her. With a shrill shriek she raised her arms above her head and fell swooning to the floor just as a pistol shot rang out. Locke, disheveled and weak, had released himself from the straitjacket, and with the speed of a panther had ascended the stairs. He saw the monster crashing through the last remaining barrier, and without hesitation he fired at the thing as he closed in. His one thought was to delay it or make it swerve in its course momentarily, with the hope that by some chance Eva might have time to escape. Could he only accomplish this, he thought his mission successful, regardless of the outcome as far as he himself was concerned. He pulled the trigger of his automatic again and again as he rushed forward. By some strange trick of fate, the figure reeled for a second, and one of its arms dropped swinging to its side. The bullet had entered a joint. Had it in some way deranged the mechanism? causing the automaton to turn in its tracks and confront Locke as he charged forward? Or was some human being concealed in the armored creature and wounded? Eva, in her semi-conscious state, saw the mass of metal charge toward Locke and closed her eyes so as not to be a witness to his end. She waited, dumb and helpless with fright, and before her surged the meaning of this man's great sacrifice for her. In the brief interval she realized that men of his ilk were few. She realized that her interest in the young chemist was more than a passing fancy, and the truth was driven home to her in his hour of peril. She closed her eyes, and all before her went blank. As the automaton faced Locke, 
voices could be heard in the hall, and the gardener of Brent Rock, who had summoned aid, came to Locke's assistance. Armed with clubs and garden tools, the men charged the monster. Like a lion at bay, the thing turned from its task of destroying Locke to face its new enemies. En masse they attacked the automaton, but it shook them off, one by one, as a terrier would rats, and made its way toward the grand staircase. Some of the gardener's aides suffered broken bones, while others were left unconscious as a result of the conflict. Locke picked himself up and rushed to Eva's side. He took the prostrate form in his arms and looked down into her beautiful face. The room was in ruins, and Eva slowly opened her eyes and looked up at him. Her hand went out in a momentary caress, but as she fully recovered consciousness, she moved her hand away, lest he really know. She looked up at him gratefully, and Locke, a little confused, took his arm from around her waist. With boyish bashfulness, he hung his head and asked her if she was all right. The sound of his own voice amid the ruins brought back his composure. "'We must see about father. Perhaps something has happened to him.' said Eva, as she started toward the door. Locke looked after the girl, then followed her. Propped up in bed, Peter Brent presented a pitiable sight. His glassy stare and shrill laugh like a coyote baying at the moon sent cold chills down Eva's back as she entered the room. This man, at one time a power in the business world, was only a shell of his former self, and his inhuman laughter caused even Locke to shudder a little as he entered the room. Eva walked over to her father and put her hand to his brow, looking wistfully in his eyes for some sign of recognition. She kissed him on the forehead and called him, but he still stared blankly ahead of him, unconscious of even her presence. Locke felt the pulse of the patient and looked at the dilated pupils. There must be some antidote for this Madagascar madness, and I shall move everything to find it, he said, as he looked at Eva with determination. She turned toward him eagerly as he spoke, and his words gave her a little cheer. Eva continued her caresses, but the demented man showed no signs of recognizing even his own daughter. From another room, the shrill laughter of Flint could be heard as he raved in delirium. Bereft of reason, he fought an unseen enemy. Q did it, I tell you, it's Q, he raved and shrieked in his insane way as he rocked back and forth in bed. He was fighting his own conscience and kept pushing some unseen thing from him as he shook in a paroxysm of fright. The front door bell rang, and Balcom entered. He was suave in manner, but this time he seemed a little excited as he gave his hat and stick to the butler. "'Tell Miss Brent I must see her at once,' he ordered. As the butler turned to mount the stairs, Balcom reached his hand up and rubbed his shoulder as though he were in pain. Perhaps the gesture meant nothing, but a keen observer would have noticed that his arm did not move with the freedom that one would expect of a man of his frame and build. As he rubbed his shoulder, his eyes followed the butler up the stairs and his lips tightened. He watched him until he was out of sight, then turned and entered the library. As Balcom entered the library, the doorbell rang, and the three ambulance men who had been overpowered by the emissaries of the automaton entered. Balcom approached them, and hasty explanations were forthcoming. In his suave manner he quieted the most noisy of the trio, who by this time had found the straitjacket from which Locke had just released himself. "'This looks like a put-up job to me.' growled the driver as he confronted Balcom, holding the straitjacket toward him. "'And I believe you know something about it.' "'My dear man, 
"'I am the person who telephoned for you to come for my stricken partner,' said Balcom, "'and I still insist that he is in dire need of treatment.' As he spoke, Eva entered the library in time to hear him. She was followed by Locke. "'My father shall not be taken from this house,' she cried, in reply to Balcom's orders to the attendants. As she spoke, she turned toward Locke and looked at him for his acquiescence. He quietly nodded toward her in an assuring manner, and as he did so, one might have noticed Balcom's face cloud up with evil purpose. He was thinking of this young whippersnapper and his interference with his plans. As he stood meditating, he noticed that Locke was looking at him, so he turned toward the young chemist, and his whole expression changed. A bland smile crept across his face as he spoke. "'I was only suggesting that my partner be taken to an institution, because I believed that he would receive better treatment there.' He addressed Locke, but looked toward Eva as he did so. "'Miss Brent should have trust in me. I have only her interest at heart.' "'It would be better for Mr. Brent to stay here,' said Locke. "'The treatment his daughter can give will be better than that of an outsider.' As he spoke, he sauntered away with an air of finality, while Balcom shrugged his shoulders and gave orders to the ambulance men to go. Locke walked toward the dining-room, and there, amid the candle drippings and the wreckage of the night before, espied the miniature automaton. He picked it up and examined it minutely as Balcom strolled in. Balcom's quick gaze caught what Locke was looking at, and he approached the young chemist and suavely said, "'It seems almost unbelievable, Mr. Locke, that a giant form like that could be endowed with a human brain.' As he spoke, he pointed toward the miniature automaton in Locke's hands. Locke turned and faced him his jaw tightening with a snap. "'Not unbelievable, but impossible, Mr. Balcom,' he said. "'I believe that there is someone in this thing that attacks us and calls himself Q.' He eyed Balcom as he spoke, to see the effects of his words. But if Balcom knew anything, he cunningly concealed it. Locke walked to the table and closely examined the candles and other stuff strewn about. He was looking for some clue to what had caused the madness of Brent and Flint. The crumpled anatomy chart lay on the floor, and as Locke stooped to pick it up, Eva entered and came toward him. She shuddered slightly as she passed the miniature of the monster, and Balcom, with an air of satisfaction, noticed her fear. He turned and was about to go out when the butler entered with the duplicate candlestick in his hands. "'Mr. Locke, in cleaning the hall I found this behind the portieres at the entrance to below stairs,' he announced. "'I was quite puzzled for a moment, for I knew the master had taken it into the dining-room with him last evening.' As he spoke, he handed the candlestick to Locke who quickly compared it with the one on the dining-room table which contained the burnt candles. In appearance, the candelabra were identical. Locke, with great care, examined every feature of them, looking for a clue. He took one of the whole candles from the candlestick which the butler had brought in, and scraped the wax from it with his penknife. He examined the particles carefully, then approached the candlestick which stood on the table the fatal night, and very carefully removed the wax from the stumps of candles which were still in the sockets. "'The Madagascar madness came from that candlestick,' he announced with assurance, as he pointed toward the one on the table. While he was so busily engaged, Balcom was eyeing him cunningly. He watched his every move, and was most intent in seeing just how the young man would prove his contention. "'Good morning, everyone,' came the clear voice of Paul as he entered the room and crossed over to the side of his fiancée. He was particular to ignore Locke in his greeting, and, as he approached Eva, 
he bent over her hand and kissed it. A close observer would have noticed that the girl rather drew her hand back from his caress. "'I am so sorry about your father, Eva,' whispered Paul. "'I trust the ailment is but temporary.' As he spoke, Eva thanked him mechanically for his solicitations, while Balcom glanced at his son in admiration. Locke, who was still engaged in looking at the candle drippings through his pocket magnifying glass, paid slight attention to Paul, but glanced up in time to see that there was a look of insincerity on his face. Could it be that this young scion of the Balcom fortune could in any way be connected with the automaton? Could this man, this suave, polished gentleman, have any motive for seeking the ruin or death of his fiancée? Locke seemed to be busily engaged in his task, but he was making mental notes on the conduct of young Balcom. He looked up finally and turned to Eva. "'Miss Brent, I find minute particles of some foreign substance in the wax of these candles,' he announced. They seem to be of organic origin, and I am certain that they contain the poison which has robbed your father of his mentality. I am going to take them to a chemical laboratory where there will be proper facilities to have them analyzed. Perhaps there is an antidote that will restore your father's sanity. As Locke spoke, he carefully wrapped up the particles of drippings in a piece of paper and put them in his pocket. As he did so, both Balcom and Paul exchanged hurried glances, and Balcom left the group and started toward the hall. During all this procedure, Zita, clad in a sumptuous morning frock hardly befitting a secretary, was standing behind the portieres in the hall and listening intently to all she could hear within the dining room. As she heard Balcom's footsteps, she hurriedly turned and seemed to be going up the hall. He looked after her and then called. She came toward Balcom with a nod of understanding, and, as she approached, he led her to a corner of the hall and whispered to her, "'It is imperative that we get Flint out of the house tonight. I can trust you to take care of this if I arrange the details?' Zita quickly nodded acquiescence, looking furtively over her shoulder to see if they were observed. "'I will get him to your apartment,' she hurriedly said, as she looked up at him for further instructions. Balcom turned quickly from her, got his own hat and sack, and departed, just as Locke came into the hall, bound for the chemist's shop. He looked after the disappearing form of Balcom, and then turned and noticed that he was being watched by Zita. Zita, in turn, hastily entered the library without looking over her shoulder. "'I wonder what her real position in this house can be,' mused Locke as he took his hat and went toward the front door. In the dining room, Paul was now standing close to Eva and had taken her hand. "'You know it was your father's wish that we be married,' he was saying and I know that he would be happy if we had the ceremony performed at once." His eyes narrowed as he said this, but Eva was too preoccupied to see it. With a shudder, ever so slight, she looked up at his handsome face and spoke. "'I will not even speak of marriage until my father recovers, Paul, and I don't know how you can ask me to at such a time.' She was not thinking so much of her father as of a certain young chemist who had risked his life for her. Why had fate thrown him in her way, she wondered? What was there about Quentin Locke that compelled her attention, that made her feel secure when he was about? What was the difference between the young chemist and Paul that she felt perfect trust in the one whom she had only known a short time? and distrust and uncertainty in the other to whom she was about to be married. She hung her head and went into the drawing-room, leaving Paul standing there. He looked after her, 
and a slight smile crossed his face as he thought of what a fool she was to think that he cared for her. His self-assurance led him to believe that the reason that Eva was not consenting to his proposal was indeed because of her father's condition, for he little dreamed, nor would his egotism permit him to believe, that anything else could be the case. His mouth hardened in a subtle smile as he sauntered after Eva to bid her farewell. He remembered that Deluxe Dora was waiting outside for him in her speedster. He had made this paramour of his take him to the very door of his fiancée's home and there wait until he had paid his respects to the moneyed lady who would make happiness possible by supplying him with the funds to pursue his pleasures and ensure his father's hold on the International Patents Incorporated. Paul looked at his watch, then, after a few words of condolence which would hardly sound sincere from anyone less gifted, made a hurried departure toward the corner where the speedster was waiting. "'Who was the funny gink that hurried by a little while ago?' queried Dora, in the vernacular of her calling. "'He gave me the double O as though he had something on me.' "'That's a fellow we've got to look out for, kid,' answered Paul, in the same terms by which he was addressed, for, if nothing else, Paul could be as much at home in the underworld as in a mansion on the drive." "'Brent claims that he was a chemist before he went bugs,' continued Paul. "'But I have my doubts. In fact, I'm very leery of him, because I think he's a fly-cop.' He took his place beside Dora, who started the car and headed downtown. After Paul's departure, Eva hurried to her father's room and tried to comfort him. He was seated in a chair, staring blankly ahead of him. He was quieter now, but his body twitched nervously from time to time. The tears started to come to Eva's eyes as she saw her father's plight, and she knelt down beside him and took his hand in hers. She stroked it with her own hand and bent over and kissed it. As she knelt, crying softly, she sobbed half aloud, "'Why can't I confide in you, father?' Why can't you advise me? I don't love Paul Balcom and could never marry him. I know I love Quentin Locke. I do. I do. As she sobbed, she bent over his hand and pressed it to her lips. Peter Brent sat staring into space, staring like a graven image. End of chapter 6 Recording by Roger Moline